Welcome to this academic life, episode sixty-seven. This episode is sponsored by the School of Engineering at Rensselaer Polytech Institute. Did you know that RPI is the first university to have a quantum computer on the campus? It's IBM's System One, Eagle processor with one hundred twenty-seven qubits. Stay tuned for discoveries from RPI Engineering using the quantum computer that will change the world. This is your host Lucy Zhang, and I'm Panya Newell, another favorite host. So Kim can't join us today, and while she's not here, probably、uh, easy for the two of us to kind of change it up a bit. You may feel like this is sum up of、uh, more casual episodes. Hopefully, this. Suits your taste. Well, I want to talk about implicit bias. The reason I was thinking about this is I went to a conference, and then at the conference, I met two of my junior colleagues, not from my same institution, just people who work in the same field. But they're relatively junior; they just got their tenure. So we were sitting there having breakfast, and what's their next step? They said, "Well, of course, getting full professor, because they just got through tenure, and maybe tenure for a couple of years by now." They asked me what it takes to become full. These two are young men, all right, so they're not really minority in any way. So for them to get tenure, as far as I know, was pretty straightforward. So I told them that when I went through. This full professor promotion process, it was painful, and then they asked me why. I said, "Well, I was going through a lot between tenure to get full. I had two kids. Immediately after getting tenure, my son was born, and then another year later, year and a half, my daughter was born, and then I had a really bad health problem. So another two years went by." So by this time, it's already four years after my tenure, and then by the time I restarted my research again, it was difficult. I felt like I went back to square one. It was way more difficult than when I was a assistant professor, and also I felt double standards. Double standards, in a way, it's very subtle. We all know that when you go through tenure promotion, no one will give you a hard set of rules to follow. It's not to say, well, if you get this number of papers published, you'll get promoted, or if you get this amount of dollars, you get promoted. There's no such thing. So the reason I was thinking of double standards was when I was going to fall, my department head at the time said, well. Your volume is not there, and I said, "What do you mean volume?" And then he said, "Well, volume, you know, everything, publication, graduate student supports." I think he meant money, so he meant money. I had money, but I'm guessing what he's saying is it's not enough money. Anyways, the reason he said was we had faculty who recently got promoted has H index of sixty. So he's telling me that I need sixty in order to get promoted. I'm like sixty. I'll never get there. I can tell you now, I will never get there, and it's not my goal, my life goal, to get to H index of sixty. Fast forward another two years, I think eventually I did get enough money, so I got promoted. It was enough for them to say, "Well, let's promote her." The year I got full, I participated. In the next round of full promotion meeting, and then in the meeting, there are other young people who are ready to get promoted. The same person who said that I don't have enough because H index is not enough. The same person evaluating the next case. The case is a man. He has in H index of twenty, and he had less publications than me. And his publications, where his name, are only appearing in the middle. They're not the first author. They're not the contacting author. But they're simply in the middle. That means 
it's not significant, in my opinion. All mine are. All mine are either I'm the contacting author, or because my student is the first author, or I'm the only sole author. The same person who said mine was not enough said, "Oh yeah, he does great research," and that's all. He went through promotion. He got promoted to full. Not a single person questioned the the criteria that made him there. I struggled, and I was told it was the same reason that I wasn't there because my H index, my publication, or whatever it is. And in my opinion, based on looking at the new case and my case, and I said that's double standard. That's really double standard. Either they went too low for him, or they went too high for me. I know this for a fact. I experienced it. It was my own case.、Mm -hmm. I know exactly what happened. I know exactly what my case looks like. I know exactly what his case looks like. What do you do to point it out? But anyway, the reason I'm bringing up this is that when those two young men asked me, "How did you get to full? What did it take to get to full?" And I said the challenge is double standards. For me, that's the most challenging part, and it's very frustrating. And then they said, "Oh, really? It's usually the other way around. What we know is that they always lower standards for women going up promotion." I heard that, and I came home. I was so bothered by that reaction. I could not believe. I'm not saying anything bad about these young men. They are doing great. They're being honest. They're simply being honest. What I'm trying to say here is that you see that implicit bias that's being imposed upon us is not being viewed same or being perceived the same way as men or people who's never experienced this before. So it bothered me for days. I can tell you, I was so frustrated. I didn't have words to express myself about my feeling, just the feeling of of being ignored and being wronged in so many ways. And I cannot go back to those two young men and say, "You guys are wrong." It's not their experience. How would they know? But I, I told them it's my experience. That's really what happened. But、right? they can receive it or not. This is not just your experience. I'm way more junior than you, and I had the same exact experience. I recently went through the the ten year process. Not that it was oh my god, they told me wait and delay or anything. But now I sit on the other side, and I see people. With two publications, with their students getting tenure, the only difference that I see is male versus female. And then the same time, a female colleague who was supposed to go, being told, "Oh, you don't have enough publication with your student." And these are the things that I've seen it with my own exact eye. And then you are saying that those two gentlemen. That's what they are hearing because all these men, when they get tenure, they go and they talk about how easy they were on female faculty. I had a male colleague that you know him quite well, telling me that I got a faculty position because I'm a woman. Right into my eyes, looking at the Zoom, it was during the pandemic, and told me, and I should have. I was so shocked. I didn't say anything, but I, after that, I thought I should have said. So you are saying your mom could got my job without having any technical contribution in the field or anybody who's just being identified as a female. But at the time, I was so frozen, I couldn't have any reactions. And then also, another fear that I did never followed up with him because. Or at least respond in any way or shape or form, because he's very senior and very well known in our field. So I think that it's both women and men contributing to this. Women they are afraid of saying things, or when finally they overcome the shock, 
it's too late to go back for whatever reason, like you, you couldn't even, like you didn't respond, you were shocked and you were sad and you were hurt. And so I think that, I think personally, because I made this mistake, I think you should write back to them. Tell them that, well, remember we had this conversation, I've been thinking about it and whatever, like just went out. Just tell well, but them. The, the problem is that I, because- I have no blame on them. I mean, this is yes, but they need to. But this is your chance to tell tell your side of a story, and then also being a voice for many other women. Because if you don't say it, that's it's going to be in their mindset. They are like, "Oh, Lucy was one case." Because we never talk, we are so shocked at the moment, and we never discuss it. And they always think many, many. My cousin, she's a faculty and she was told the first NSF grant that she got, it was the first year with three other female faculty, like 800, 900,000, which is for NSF is huge. And then the male colleagues, they told her that, oh, you guys got it because you are all women. And she was into tears because she thought, we put so much effort writing this and we go to these panels. I've never seen in any panels, they say, let's separate the women from male and then just rank them and give them funding or let's favor them. But this is the thing that uh, these are the myths that it goes around and everybody thinks that women, they are being favored. Yeah, so this is exactly my point. My point is that... How do they get this impression? They've never seen the case. I don't think they've seen a case. Or the people who was talking to your cousin have never seen the case, but they just, this is their entire belief that women are being favored in every situation at work. I mean, in our field. So I thought about this and I've actually talked to, <laughs> talked to my husband a little bit because he can see it more objectively. And when I told him, I said, uh, I want to express my frustration, not about the two men who, who heard my story, but I was mostly frustrated by this general impression of people who never experienced this before. How do they get there in the first place? And then how do they even believe me. Of course, I know them well enough. They will believe this is my story, but they can say, well, it's only your story. They can say you're just one data point. Sure, you're fine, but I don't know about all this stuff because that's all in my, in my mind that's already shaped and formed and you are different. He said, I will never be able to understand what you go through because I'm a white man. I will never experience it. What he figured was this. There's so much implicit bias that's been taking place for so long. And we all know it. So that's exactly why there are double standards for promotion. Some for men, some for women. This is why it's implicit. I don't think those people who made those um, judgment on my case and another person's case, I don't think he does it intentionally. I really don't think he did. Men, women didn't even occur to him. That's why it's implicit. Like it's in, it's in him already. Like he doesn't even know he's doing it. But because there are so many implicit bias taking place, people are trying to correct it using explicit bias. Explicit is whatever you can observe. And people, we talk about it all the time. We go out and have all these organizations or groups championing for women to be equal. But for a lot of men, all they heard is, oh, they want more, they want more. And they're, they've they been given more because there are unique opportunities for women. Because you're women, because the women group have been, that's all you hear. That's because people or organizations maybe have been somewhat trying to correct all these implicit bias that's been taking place. Because they are explicit actions. And then so in most people's mind, who's never experienced these being biased before, <laughs> all they heard is, oh, wait, yeah, women have advantage. The standards go the other way. So because that's what they've heard. Actually, so I said, that reminds me exactly of a conversation that I had with my husband, who is also a white <laughs> male. <laughs> and uh, he told me, you should always leave 
because he knows that like how I'm trying to promote women within our community, right? He said, you need to leave the women part out of it. You focus on their qualification. Say that they are doing this amazing work and you remove that part because some people, they automatically, exactly as what you said, they they just hear that women thing. They don't see those other qualifications. And that makes it weaker in your argument that mm-hmm. I want to nominate, for example, Lucy for this. And she's a highly qualified woman. And he said, no, you remove that. Mm-hmm. She is highly qualified in her field doing this, 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 this. And then he said that that's where we we need to, he thinks that we should move because then people, they don't automatically think, oh, women, they are being favored. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. And that's what I've been trying to do based on hearing from him because he said, like, you hear that exactly as you said, from the media, from everywhere, they keep hearing, they are bombarded by this. And then they automatically think I don't know less quality or being favored Mm -hmm. or whatever that those other like women being not really truly equal Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. after we kind of diagnosed where it all came from I felt much better it's not about those two men it's just the, the reaction shocked me because I also know them so well they also know me so well that reaction really shocked me and it never occurred to me that in general population think that and I wouldn't be surprised if people behind me saying oh she only got to this place because she's a woman and I never thought that about that before but after that reaction I'm thinking I'm sure it happens they just don't tell me in front of my face. <laughs> so Unless you talk to that guy that I talked to, he told me <laughs> right into my face. <laughs> the same person told me that having children is not an excuse to not show up at conferences. Yep. So there are oh. some that they tell you right into your face. <laughs> Which is fine. It was a wake up call for me. That was the day that that instant I realized It's a very unforgiving place. Not just, I'm not, not physical place, but like in certain career paths or in certain working situations, it's a very unforgiving place because that's their expectation. They're like, I have kids too. I still still come to conferences. When my kids were little, I came back and I'm like, well, I, I can see it because he's never been pregnant with two kids before and he's never breastfed two failed, kids before. Has must, yeah, has must failed his biology class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see that. Distinguishing, like there are, it's not just having kids. There are many other things attached to that. Mm-hmm. So I can't change everybody. I Honestly, I'm not sure where things will go, but I think I just come to a realization. And once the rationale came to to light, I felt much easier, I guess, to be able to reason that kind of reaction. It was just so, so shocking to me. So shocking. And it's nothing to me. It just never occurred to me. So if they never lived it, they can't feel your pain. There's nothing you can say, nothing you can do to change their mind because it's not, they, they don't know what it what it feels. I just remember that one episode we interviewed uh, Matt Pinchinat about the DEI. He was talking about his experience being a Black person. I still remember he said that it's my lived experience. And I said, oh my gosh, I never put it in that perspective before because I will never know. I'm not Black. I will never be able to to feel what he felt or experience what he experienced. I can hear the stories and put it together. And we care so we can uh, be <laughs> empathetic about it. That's really it. So I just thought I needed to vent it out yeah, and talk okay. about this implicit 
bias. Thank you for sharing it. But I still think that you should email them and let them know, even though now you are a little bit at peace. Uh, <laughs> but or or give the give their names to me. I'll send them an email. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, I'm yeah. so glad they are candid with me, though. They're at least they're candid. There are many people who just like go home and say, oh, she's complaining, right? I mean, they're candid with me. That made a whole difference. That made me think. And I think that was an honest reaction that really made me think. I appreciate it actually very much. Uh, made me think a lot after that. So anyway, how do we address it? I'm guessing simply more awareness like what we're doing now hopefully people who are listening can get something out of it but whatever it is i think a lot of it is really uh, to share those kind of experience and for those who will never experience something like this um first kudos for you second uh, give a little bit of empathy and uh if you don't have something, don't always attribute it to, to gender or any demographic divide. It's a lot of it is really if it's not just that, it's so much more. So we're all doing our best to be here, to have a place. So we're all making contributions. So don't short sell it or <laughs> diminishing it <laughs> by simply attributing everything to gender. All right. I think we can wrap up. Thank you all for listening in. And we want to thank our sponsor, uh, the School of Engineering at Rensselaer Polytech Institute for sponsor this episode. Uh, if you like to follow us and keep on following us, uh, we have more sponsorship spots. Other than that, have a wonderful time. We'll see you next time.